have so many, many ways. Mm -hmm. Hi, can I help you? Hey, this is uh, Mike at the front desk. Uh, Richard Sunkle, you got up there? Is, uh, So Hobbs, you tell me something. Shoot. Sure. I used to do that, go up to a house in the mountains and sit by the water. It's beautiful. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, where'd you go? Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Uh... Mike! Syrian Aramaic. How clever. <laughs> Beware my wrath. I want to tell you about the time I almost died. Intriguing and filled with frenetic energy, the opening line of the 1998 supernatural thriller Fallen, delivered by Denzel Washington's homicide detective Hobbs, cleverly foreshadows its ending. Despite doing so much right, released in the 90s during the oversaturated time of biblical-inspired thrillers like Seven, The Devil's Advocate, End of Days and Stigmata, Fallen disappeared into relative obscurity after its release. Regardless, it's a film you'll never forget, and definitely one worth revisiting. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as heavily requested. Today, we're exploring Fallen. We first meet Hobbs scrambling through the snow-filled woods. I never thought it would happen to me. Not at this age. Beaten. Outsmarted. How did I get into this fix? How did it all begin? If I go back to the beginning, that'll take forever. While we're led to believe that our hero is the narrator telling us his story, the truth is horrifically disturbing. We then pick up with Hobbs and Edgar Reese, a serial killer he's caught, played by Elias Koteas, talking just before the latter's execution, where Reese claims to be proud of his wrongdoings, opting not to repent. He grabs Hobbs' hand and delivers a spiteful monologue in Aramaic before singing Time Is On My Side by the Rolling Stones during his execution, a song that continues to haunt us. Strangely, at the last second, Reese behaves differently and starts shouting that he's innocent. It's here that we notice a strange presence passing from Reese to a security guard before moving through a number of other individuals. Hobbs and his colleagues then scratch their heads at a variety of copycat murders, throwing doubt as to whether they executed the right man. They didn't. Further adding fire to his flames of doubt is the resurgence of the song Reese was singing before his death from odd people in the street. But while the detectives are stumped, we're repeatedly presented with one incredibly suspicious man at the scene of one of the murders. Understandably, we latch onto this guy as the masterminding supernatural murderer until he becomes one of the victims. This blows our expectations, effectively destabilizing us with the uncertainty that then becomes key to the film's narrative. Do you like riddles? Why is there a space between Lyons and Spikowski? Following hints left by Reese and the copycat killer, Hobbs tracks down Greta Milano, who explains that her father, a former detective, killed himself in an isolated cabin after being accused of a series of occult murders similar to the ones Hobbs is investigating. Visiting the abandoned lake house, he finds several unsettling books about demonic possession in the basement, along with the name Azazel written on the wall, obscured under grime. Well, what does Azazel mean? If you enjoy your life, if there's even one human being you care about, don't take this case. Azazel is essentially found in the Hebrew Bible, mentioned three times in Leviticus 16. In the ancient rite of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, two goats were sent bearing the sins of all the Jewish people. One of these goats was meant for the Lord, while the other was for Azazel, and once the sins were transferred to the goats, dubbed scapegoats, the one which was for Azazel was sent into the wilderness and cast off a cliff. He became the personification of uncleanness and was later dubbed the fallen angel, one expelled from heaven due to their sins. Turns out the fallenness demon has been living among us for thousands of years, enjoying himself by tormenting humanity. But I'm still having fun. Aren't you still having fun? This twists the entire dynamic of the film. Instead of the killer being on the run from the cops, Detective Hobbs becomes the prey, with Azazel passing from body to body in an attempt to torment him like he did with Greta's father. This paranoia rubs off onto us, forcing us to also search the edge of frames and double-check characters to determine whether they're in fact possessed, perfectly aligning us with Hobbs' feelings of total isolation. Assessing the scrawled letters on Azazel's victims, Hobbs pulls together the word apocalypse. 
Does apocalypse uh, does mean anything to you? Sure it does. Apocalypse was the Greek word for revelation. After trying to end Azazel's reign of terror by shooting a man he's possessing, alongside his fingerprints being found in another scene, Hobbs is cast out of the police force and becomes the key suspect in their case. Of course, they aren't buying the whole possessed by a fallen angel narrative, and fellow officers played by powerhouses John Goodman, James Gandolfini, and Donald Sutherland are all suspicious of him. They think that he was either the serial killer from the beginning, or that he became a copycat killer through his obsession with the investigation. Outside, they can survive for one breath only. I guess they are limited in certain ways. What are you thinking? I don't know. After his brother is murdered by Azazel and his nephew Sam is marked, Hobbs leaves him in Greta's care. Discovering the demon can only travel so long between bodies, Hobbs formulates a plan to protect his friends and family. If he can kill the person possessed by Azazel and also take his own life, the fallen angel will die and no longer exist in our world. Tempting the fallen angel by luring him to Milano's cabin, in a twist on twist, Hobbs is tailed by Stanton and Jonesy, who arrive to arrest Hobbs before Jonesy kills Stanton. Life always gives you one more surprise. Sometimes it's a big one. Where's Hazel? Hey, I'm your partner, man. Here Azazel divulges that the entire game of cat and mouse was about Hobbs. The demon had been trying to possess him since his first encounter with Reese, but was unable to do so because he was a good and honourable person. A line that has become blurred as a result of his actions, which then cast the moments that Azazel was able to pass from person to person in a new, terrifying light. The two fight and Jonesy is mortally wounded, leading to Hobbs quickly smoking a cigarette laced with the same poison that the demon had used to kill his brother, ensuring that there's no place for Azazel to go. Just you and me. What is this? You don't smoke anymore. Because cigarettes kill, especially cigarettes laced with poison. Hobbs thought that he'd beaten Azazel, something the demon also believed, but they were both wrong. And it's here that we realize the scramble at the beginning of the film was Azazel and Hobbs' body struggling to stay alive. Oh, you forgot something, didn't you? At the beginning, I said I was going to tell you about the time I almost died. Unfortunately, despite his current host no longer being valid, he doesn't need a human host, which should have been obvious considering this moment halfway through the film. And the demon slinks off into the night in the body of the cat as Hobbs slowly dies. The twist is the perfect underscore for the film, underlining the bleak hopelessness of Hobbs fighting against an entity that has bested humanity for millennia. Time is most certainly on his side. Time is on my side. With that being said, I'd love to know what you thought about the film, so please share this in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, come join our regular streams on Twitch, and uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.